I'm here with one of my favorite men in the whole world, Gary Oldman, who's been kind enough to come off the set in disguise because he's shooting a film right now. So uh, he doesn't look a lot like Winston Churchill, but he's, uh, he is, of course, he is Winston Churchill as far as most of us are concerned. And I'm delighted to be able to have a few minutes talking with him uh, and about how he got Winston Churchill to fly in such a fantastic way. But I'm told, Gary, that you are, as far as most of the world out there is concerned, you are Winston Churchill, but yet I'm told that you turned down the role originally. Is that true? Can that be true? Oh, of course. I mean, it's, well, it seems to be my process. I turned most roles down and then they kind of wash back up on the shore. <laughs> they go away and then they, and then they, 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 they come back. Um, I could not imagine myself as Winston. Um, uh, I don't, uh, I don't re re resemble him in any way. I certainly don't. I don't have the f physique. Um, uh, I'm not as tall as I thought I was. Um, I think I might be an inch taller than Winston, an inch and a half taller. But I, I it wasn't until my, uh, I think somewhere along the line, I'd put down that I'm 5'10", because actors... <laughs> you know, to, they take a few years off their age. Off their age, and and and, um, and, uh, and then my wife said, "No, you're five eight, darling. You know, <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you, you're not. You know, I'm too yeah. tall to be. No, you're not. No, you're not too tall. But um, yeah, you you. I just thought um, Chamberlain. You know, just my physique." Um, there are a few people I, I, I could, could, off the top of my head, think, oh, I could play that. Yeah, that's in my wheelhouse, you know. Um, but Churchill I'd, was completely uh, blindsided. Mm -hmm. I had never saw that one coming. How, is it, how important is it for you as an actor to actually inhabit the skin, so actually have the skin? And because, as you say, you know, if you don't look like this, this hard drinking, cigar smoking, uh, aging political adventurer. Yeah. Um, so how did all that come about? And is it crucial for you to be, as an actor to be able to do the role properly, to feel that you look like him? Well, here's the thing. Yes, it, 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 when you're playing someone like this, um, it helps if you can, you know, you're looking for something which is beyond the makeup, which is outside of the makeup. Um, with with Churchill, I was in part. I needed it for you, for the audience. Mm -hmm. um, he's so iconic. Mm -hmm. The silhouette is is you just see that hat and the profile. It's like that famous silhouette of. Hitchcock, mm. you know, you see the cigar. I mean, Mike. I mean, he knew marketing. Churchill, mm. come on, mm -hmm. you know, b before mm. it even was a thing. Um, and uh, so, the audience has an expectation, and they know uh, who they know what he looked like. Mm. They or they think they know what he looked like. They they. That, and I did too going in um, because I had also been influenced by other performances. Is, is that, was that important to you in preparing for the role, going and seeing what others had done before? No, I didn't. Mm. I just remember. Mm. Yeah, they um, stick in the mind. They stick in the mind and you think he's this curmudgeon, sort of shuffling uh, curmudgeon who's shouting at everybody and is sort of just miserable and a, a grumpy man with a cigar. And what I found uh, in my homework, research, whatever you mm. want to call it, um, a dynamic man, younger than his years, 
that that was that was the first thing that struck me watching the footage um, particularly the, there's one where he's visiting the troops and he's marching ahead of everyone so that was that was the that was the first thing that struck me was he moved with such a sort of fixity of purpose he moved through space he wasn't this sort of shuffling old man that I somewhere got mm. in my head. Um, so that was, uh, yes, the makeup is, it was a, an important thing, but I mean, I could do him now for you. Mm. I, it's not like I, I mm. needed the makeup. Yeah. Um, uh, but capturing the spirit or the essence of someone. I can't be him. I, I can't sound exactly like him. I can't move exactly like him. But I can truthfully, hopefully truthfully represent him. And what I saw was a dynamic man uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and of course the penny drops and it makes sense of what he achieved, the books he wrote. I mean, he lived the life of three men. Mm. <laughs> um, and you marvel, where did he write, where did he get time to run the government, write these speeches, deal with the everyday thing of just being a prime minister, a memo here, a note here. Um, and, he's, and, he's, and he's writing these voluminous books and he's painting um, in his downtime, whenever that was. Um, uh, it, it's a, a remarkable. It's like it's like playing a machine. Okay, so, I mean, I'm, I'm told that you spent four hours a day in makeup yeah. to get the physical side of it. Yeah. And how did you get into his character? How did you get into the inner man? How did you discover all these things about the, his soul? Because your representation of Winston Churchill is in many ways so very different and far more subtle than many of the previous Winston Churchills we've seen. Well, it's very school. kind of you. Um, you look for the, it's a frequency. Uh, finding a character is, it's like hearing a radio station through static. You, you, you can't quite find the frequency mm. for it. You kind of hear it, but but it's it's in it's way off. And by working on the script, by looking at the material, as the pieces come together, you start to find the station. And there's a sparkle in the eyes of Churchill. Mm. There's the schoolboyish sort of twinkle, I called it. It was like the no it was like the kid who had nicked some licorice from the tuck shop or something. A cat that has the cream. Um, and so you see the motor. The, the the incredible sort of mind working, um, not missing anything. The eyes were cat. He, he he was catching everything, and it was like any minute now. Um, it, it, you know what it is? It's a little like if you were to think of an actor with the same kind of quality. I th would think of someone like Jack Nicholson. You see Jack Nicholson in a, in a scene and you always feel that any minute now he's going to look at the camera and wink. This, <laughs> and I got the same thing from Churchill. Yeah. And what you do is you put these pieces together. You're reading the material. You're reading about the achievements. You're, you're now, because his writing is, is so... Um, 
uh, it's uh, subjective and, it, and you're there reading the words, the thoughts. Um, so it's a very, it's very personal, the writing. So you're getting a sense of the mind and, um, and, and all of that. So you've got this brain, you're looking at the eyes, you're looking at the motor, you're looking at the physicality. And as you sort of uh, look at the words that you have to say and you start speaking them out loud, um, you'll watch interviews, he did this little thing with his head, you see the thing he does with the mouth, he always has the cigar on the left side of the mouth, the way he used his hands when he was speaking, whether they were here, whether they were under, under the lapels, or and he would gesture and then the arm would come straight down. You look at, you're putting all these things together and very slowly and then the, and then the station starts mm -hmm. to come in. And then you go, I got him. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know exactly how that happens. But what's really important, of course, is the, is the, is the message that's left at the end. The message you leave at the end about Winston Churchill is quite extraordinary. D did you change your view about Winston while you were doing all this massive research and preparing for the role? Well, actually, well, let me, uh, going back to theatrical license, you know that, that these speeches were... Um, a lot of the, were recorded after the fact. I think mm. you know, and I could imagine him being in his bed with his with his with, you know with his white wine or whatever and his cigar, and they stick a microphone under his mm. nose, and you know, um, and, and there he is, uh, Mr. Speaker, on Friday evening last, I, and. So you listen to these recordings, and I felt that there was, this is my, this is my take on it, my interpretation or my feeling, was that when he was in the house with the crowd, because he had a sense of the theatrical, mm -hmm. there's no doubt about that, and fancied himself as a bit of an actor, um, I, I, I think politicians have to be. Um, uh, I felt that they would have been given a little more gusto, that there would have been probably with, with the audience um, a, a, a tad more Henry V to them. You have to command the House of Commons. And as you say, and I entirely agree with you, in fact, you've stolen one of my key questions oh. here about the speeches, because there are three speeches in the, yeah. in the film. And the recordings we have of two of them, they are recordings, they are done in his bed or whatever, and they lack all energy. And I, I actually find them really rather disappointing. This is not Winston Churchill actually changing the course of history with words, because the energy is there, the life is, the words are the same, Yeah, but you need to have that acting ability, as you said, which Winston had. So you... I only had the recordings, and for me, they were a little, um, what, uh, under-energized, um, beautifully spoken, um, and I, so I just took the liberty of, of interpreting them and thinking, actually, when he was really there in the moment, he was filling the space, first of all, and he had a damn good voice. And um, it, it wouldn't have just been, we will fight on the beaches, we will fight in the, we will fight in the hills. We, it, it must have been a cry of... Uh, a, a, it's a war cry. Come on. I mean, we're a, we're we're at war with, you know, the most evil of evils. Um, and he was a leader, and he led. He led by example in those moments. Yeah. They really. I mean, that that the, the, the beaches speech, which the film finishes on, is in my view uh, one of the finest speeches ever made in the English language. 
uh, and the idea that uh, it wasn't a great adventure for everybody who was sitting in that room uh, and in that chamber. Yeah. It, it, it had to be that way, and that's what the film grasps in a way which the, the recordings don't. And he does it also with very simple language. Mm. He doesn't highfalute. He doesn't embroider it. Mm. And it's not what I call purple prose, you mm. know. It's all... He does it with very, very simple words. Very Anglo-Saxon, mm. good, honest words that 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 you're going to hear the people sitting at those radio, at those crystal sets would would hear and um, and hear that the 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 cry you know so it sounds it sounds to me that i mean this of course this was one of many roles that you've done over your yeah. career but it was uh i mean it won you an oscar it did uh, and, and and very yeah. deservedly so and i think everybody watching this this uh, little webinar broadcast will will agree with that they will all be huge fans um and so you would, I, I mean, it doesn't always happen with everybody who plays Winston Churchill. Richard Burton, for instance, said that to play Winston Churchill is to hate him. I don't think that you reached that conclusion, did you? Oh, I loved him. Mm. Um, yeah, it's the funniest thing. I would, uh, I, we, uh, for a time, we were at um, Ealing, at the old Ealing studios. And they, they, I kind of like them because they're still sort of old school and, and uh, they need a bit of a, bit of a TLC. Mm. But I didn't mind the fact that I was in the old dressing room that, you know, probably Alec Guinness was in or, you know. And um, I was at the end of the corridor. And in the corridor, that is where they held all the soldiers and the various officials and secretaries and all the people that were working in the war room. They built the set, the war room. I come out of the dressing room, walk down the corridor and then go into the set. And it was amazing that I would come out fully dressed, fully made up, walked to the set, and as I passed, men would stand up straight, a couple would salute, the, the, the girls would all like go, you know, and, it, it, and people would look at me like the prime minister. They would treat me, you know, like the, like I was the man. Now, That's like recall for them. Mm. They've heard about this man. They've seen these photographs of this man. Some of them may have been to the war room and, and, and some of them may have studied history. But these like people off the street or would be wannabe actors or just these extras, these background people, and they come in and they get dressed up to spend a couple of weeks, you know, being secretaries and soldiers in this war room. Um, yet they even bristled a, a, around me and I can't imagine uh, the just the sort of I see I just loved him adored him I thought he was charismatic I thought he was incredibly witty um, was he perfect no one is, you know. Um, but you gotta like people. You've gotta you've gotta love them to 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 play them. I I learned this years ago reading an autobiography or biography, of, autobiography of Laurence Olivier, and he was doing, he was the Arms and the Man, and he was in this play, and he just wasn't any damn good in this role. And he went to the director and he said, and I, I don't know what it is. He said, it's because you despise the character you're playing. You'll never be any good in the role unless you can find some redeeming quality and learn to love him. 
you'll never be any good in this part. Okay. So I find that to play him is to hate him. Uh, that might have well been the material. I don't really remember the Burton. Yeah, that, with, that, that, that may be why we don't remember him because it wasn't actually a great, uh, a great tour de force as, as far as uh, Winston Churchill. You know, I've so. seen clips of it. it yeah, it's, and he um, sort of was a bit. Was he a little lazy? Um, he kept all of his hair, he, and uh, <clears throat> and, 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 he, and he spoke like Richard yes, Burton. Yes, <laughs> oh, Elizabeth. You might say that I couldn't possibly comment. Um, uh, but tell me, look, if Winston were here with us today, you obviously uh, just embrace the whole concept and the character of the man <clears throat> and the journey that it's taken you on. What would you be? What would you want to talk with him about today? I would want to ask him why he would eat his main course dessert and smoke at the same time. 